Hi, I'm Ian Hickey, Co-Director of Health and Policy at the Brain and Mind Centre of the University of Sydney, and I've been here at the International Society of Bipolar Disorders in Reykjavik in Iceland, 66 degrees north, where it can be cold, it can be wet, got glaciers, got volcanoes, but they've got light and seasonal variation. And discussing many of those things that are most important in bipolar disorder and most important to us in its study, particularly that related to circadian rhythms, other biological rhythms, and so-called chronotherapies or timing therapies. Time of the day, season of the year, how much light exposure you get in the morning, how much you get in the evening. Here in Reykjavik, if you're lucky, you can see the northern lights late in the evening, bright green and red sometimes. What's really important is an increased understanding of the role of circadian rhythms in driving mood disorder, onset of bipolar disorder, changes in motor activation, but also changes in metabolism, the extent to which insulin resistance has been emphasised. And a really good set of studies saying you've got to measure fasting insulin. Measuring fasting glucose alone, not enough. Other great partnerships with Kathleen Merikangas from the National Institutes of Mental Health had a worldwide M March consortia measuring motor activity, the extent to which motor activity and energy drive mood across time, and the extent to which that is variable to a great deal in people with bipolar disorder. Also, really important associations between bipolar disorder and suicidal behaviour, the extent to which suicidal behaviour is a predictor, along with substance abuse and family history of the onset of bipolar disorder, the extent to which poorly treated bipolar disorder is very problematic in the long term in terms of suicide risk, health risk and functional outcomes. Importantly also, what we've been trying to do is increase the emphasis on early intervention. Still really controversial. Task forces of the International Society of Bipolar Disorder do take up issues related to early intervention and chronobiology and circadian rhythms. But early intervention remains actually strongly neglected in these areas. So one of our major attempts is to get people in the field to focus on earlier recognition, to work with those with lived experience, so we can find out what are the earliest possible signs and take effective action. In a lot of our discussion with people with lived experience in this conference and in a previous day we spent with the Daymark Foundation discussing this issue related to early intervention is the very poor state of mental health services for young people with major mood disorders particularly bipolar disorder. So most research, most work has been done with people in their 40s and the 50s in the past, after 20 or even 30 years of a major bipolar or major mood disorder. We still have a huge way to go to improve services for those who present early, typically in their teenage years, very strong youth focus to make a big difference. And we're incredibly grateful to the people who lived experience who are really helping us to take that forward. In the future, we think digital methods wearable technologies, other actual ways of measuring sleep, activity, body temperature, internal circadian systems will help us to identify those most at risk. Hopefully, we'll see more of this across the world through global cooperation. So one of the things to come out of these conferences and a reason to travel a lot is to make sure Australia is represented, but also to promote those global networks. Those that are now being supported by people like the Wellcome Trust, by the Daymark Foundation, by funding in Canada, and hopefully, by increased funding in Australia.